Hello and welcome to Become the Teapot. I'm Ian. And so am I. Each episode we watch one film and read the comic that it's based on. Then we prattle on about it for a bit in the hopes that it makes for a vaguely listable podcast. The results have varied so far, but either way we ask you, dear listener, to join us. This episode we're looking at The Old Guard from all the way back in the year 2020. Dun dun dun. Like most of our episodes, I've seen the film and not read the comic. But unlike usual, Ian is watching and reading for the very first time. Lucky me. So, will he like them? And which is better? Let's Let's find find out. out. So, this week, I'm actually quite interested in what you thought of the film, first of all. Unlike usual, then? Yeah. (laughs) Okay, uh, right, so you want to know what I thought? Mm Mm-hmm. So I'll start with the positives. (laughs) I'm surprised that you have positives. (laughs) This, to me, didn't feel like your kind of film, but what are your views? It wasn't. No, I I mean, I I think the film does a better job of establishing the characters, giving Mm -hmm. them a sense of who they are, what their roles on the team are, and what their relationship between them is within the first act, Mm -hmm. unlike the comic, which, you know, that's not something it does until much later on. The problem I have is that once it's done that in the first act, and there is about 10 minutes before it actually gets to any action, but but once it's done that in the first act, it then begins to tread water. Mm -hmm. And then the majority of the film, it just moves at such a a glacial pace. It just became a bit tedious for me. You know, there there are too many scenes of of characters looking pensive and having these stilted conversations that that I can only assume the writers thought were a lot more profound than they actually were. (laughs) Yeah, we did. When we were watching this Friday, I think it was, it got to around the 40 minute mark. And I thought, oh, it's actually moved at quite a good speed. It's not too quick. I think it was Aquaman that you said about that whiplash. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the exact wording that you said. A narrative whiplash, but yeah. That's the one. Yeah, so this one did go very, very quickly, the first 40 minutes or so. And I thought, okay, it's not been too quick, not been too slow. But then, yeah, like you've just said, it hits that halfway mark and it's just like, okay, so you've slowed down a bit too much. Well, because it's based on quite a short comic. Obviously, the comic we're going to be discussing later is only five issues long. Yep. And, you know, it takes less than an hour to read. And this is two hours and change. And you can actively feel, when watching the film, where they're stretching out that content to fill the runtime. And, And I guess I just don't understand why. It feels pointless because this would work just as well as a 90 minute film yeah you know not a two hour epic it could just be a 90 minute action blockbuster but instead it just grinds to a halt and you know you end up in a holding pattern while you're waiting for something interesting to happen (laughs) i suppose that i've got the positive i guess of my thoughts when i first saw it compared to my thoughts now okay so this came out last year i think it was last june july time Mm -hmm. and it went straight on to netflix I'm pretty sure I watched it when it first came out, as in like the first week or so, because I just turned it on and thought, oh, yeah, I'll watch it. And this was like in the peak of lockdown, so I had sod all to do. Yeah, I had sod all to do as well, but I still managed not to watch this. (laughs) Well, this was also before we started this nice little hobby, I guess, (laughs) this side project. Yeah, no, that's true, yeah. But yeah, I put it on, and I actually, I was surprised that I enjoyed it the first time. I suppose you could say it's just the standard Netflix film. You know, around that time, the ones that I'd watched was Eight Underground, the Ryan Reynolds... Six Underground. Six Underground. I don't even know what it's It's one of those. I've not watched that that one one either, but it's meant to be bad. Yeah, don't. If I'm saying it's bad. (laughs) (laughs) And that is a Michael Bay film as well, so... Oh, even better. Double trouble. The charmingness and the charisma of Ryan does not bring that film any justice i guess yeah because that is one of the things about ryan reynolds is even the bad films you kind of think it's some charm to him he's nice Mm. problem is i I find michael bay so i don't know what the opposite of charm is but you know in your face well it's that it's not even that it's just it's skeevy and weird and over the top it just is everything lacking in charm you know you think if ryan reynolds is a nice cup of tea and a hot blanket on a cold day (laughs) uh, michael bay is 
someone just splashing ice water at you. <laughs> cool down. Whoosh. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Bay. And then pointing at some woman's tits or something and going, oh, look at that. While something explodes. Yeah, pretty much. There we go. <laughs> but yeah, and then also around that time, so just before this came out, there was the Chris Hemsworth film Extraction, which we actually spoke about off air. We did. A few weeks ago. I didn't mind that one. It had that really cool hmm. ongoing shot, you know, that, that tracking shot in the middle of it, which goes on for about 12 minutes, one big action scene. Yeah. Yeah. So those were the films Netflix wise that I watched before watching this when it came out. So I would say it's above average. With that little list that we've just put together, I would put Extraction top, this second, and then the underground film, <laughs> 6, 8, 12, whatever it's called, at the bottom. Yeah. So it is, or it feels like, a Netflix quality film. Yeah. I wouldn't have gone to the cinema to see it if that was the only way to see it. I would have waited and it came out on Netflix and watched it then, probably. Yeah. But yeah, I think the environment that I watched it in or the reasons the why I watched it was why I enjoyed it. Because it was like, oh, a new film's come out. Yes, we've not <laughs> had a new film for a while. Yeah, so they're my thoughts when I first watched it. Going back, it's still enjoyable, I'd say. It's not terrible. What was the word that I said to you just after we finished last episode? I said to you, it's surprisingly average. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I don't think it is terrible, but it certainly, for me, wasn't good. It just felt, like you say, very forgettable. You yeah. know, I think if I had watched this back in June, July last year, when it came out, I would struggle to tell you much about it nowadays. Yeah, I know that there was a lot of fighting in it. They can't die. There wasn't that much fighting. Not enough, anyway. <laughs> Well, actually, talking about the fighting, okay. the old guard, the little group of them, they are all very skilled. Combat skills, sniper, swords, handguns, the whole lot. So they've learned over the years, picked up these skills, they're all very good, but they don't use it enough. There is good scenes there, they're very smooth, they pick up the guns and the ammo from all of the bodies, which I think is great. That's something we don't get to see a lot in films. And they work well as a team. Yeah, no, I think those were the moments that were better in terms of the action scenes. I, I felt that they had been cut up too much, so it felt very choppy to me, mm -hmm. which was a shame because I get the feeling that the stunts were quite fluid. There's also a bit where Charlize Theron's character reloads her handgun between every two shots she's firing for some reason, just because I think they think the, the speed reload she does looks quite cool. So they think, oh, let's put like three or four of those in. So presumably she's just throwing ammo away. <laughs> I mean, one, one thing I will say, again, a positive for the film, one change that I liked was the removal of Andy's immortality at the end, mm -hmm. which I think made that final assault in particular more interesting than the comic book, in which yeah. it was just sort of five immortals gunning people down. Yep. No stakes at all. And like you say, I liked the interplay between the group in that fight. I like how they had to shield Andy and they were taking the bullets for mm -hmm. her, even though at times they were clearly doing a rubbish job. She kept <laughs> running off on her own and they were shooting her. But all of that was very fun. But but there weren't enough moments like that in the film for me. Yeah, I think there was a couple, one or two at the start, which I do like that one of the characters, Joe or someone, he stabs some guy and then he wipes the sword on his leg. Yeah. Which I thought that was quite funny. The action scenes where they had the weapons, they didn't have much of that in the comic book, is actually using the axes and swords and things like that, mm -hmm. which I liked because it obviously referenced their immortality. But it was about 15 minutes in the first action scene. There's about 10 minutes building up to it. It just takes so long to get to those little bursts of action. And mm -hmm. when they do, they're just not executed well enough. You know, I think even though that skyscraper assault scene is the best one in the film, it still feels a little bit staggered and stilted. It feels like there's too many gaps where they're just drawing out time until the end of the film. But, you know, you think films like The Raid, mm -hmm. Dread, Die Hard, you mm -hmm. know, those are films that manage to do skyscraper assault and maintain the momentum and excitement throughout an entire film, 90 minute runtime. This film can't even manage it for 15 minutes at the end. Of it. <laughs> I think the rest of the runtime for the film was just navel gazing interspersed with these sort of choppy, poorly executed action scenes. But yeah, as I say, in general, that fight scene at the end is the best one in the film with the whole team working together. Yeah, what you said there about the fact that they've turned her immortal at the end of the film, you have more of a threat. You have more of a, right, we've got to get from A to B. We've got to kill this guy or whatever. Yeah. But also now we've got the added on suspense, I guess of mm. oh shit this one can die she's not healed up from the last time that that guy stabbed her or yeah. shot her in the back it increases the sense of jeopardy yeah, for the character it. it raises the stakes but you know you've still got four other immortal characters and every time they fall out of a window or get shot or whatever it is you just think where well, they're gonna heal yeah even before she becomes mortal i do like her sort of i can't be asked i'm too tired for this shit because 
She is. She's tired. She's old. She's ancient. Well, actually, this is actually is one of my negatives. So I'll move, believe it or not, those were the positives that I was saying before. <laughs> These are the negatives. I mean, Andy, the main character, I felt that they really toned her down in, in terms of her self-destructive behaviour from the comic books. So oh, the yeah. comic books, you know, she's smoking, sleeping around, drinking. And instead, the film, they gave her, what was it, Baclava? What the fuck was that? I mean... It was from the dead sea i don't know <laughs> it was a whole scene about it. they get her some baklava she tastes it and she can tell you where it's from okay i mean that's not quite the completely hedonistic self-destructive character we get in the comic books. <laughs> I, I felt that they made her more of a, a generic protagonist in the film yeah they made her a bit more of a she's, oh she's a she's a hard ass with a heart you know that sort of character. she's a lot more watered down yeah Definitely. Whereas in the comic book, they definitely felt like they were immortal and it was rubbish. So I felt that when she was in jeopardy, when she lost her ability to heal, I was less invested in that because she felt more like the generic protagonist as opposed to an interesting character. I yeah. mean, okay, it's Charlize Theron and she's a good actor and all that, but it wasn't enough to make that character interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, the idea of the whole you can't die thing and you know, you've lived for years and years and years... It's something that I suppose I'm used to maybe more than you are, I guess, because you're I'm immortal. immortal. No, <laughs> um, because I've about? been watching Doctor Who for years now. And I know the actor keeps changing and stuff, but it can be quite a, a plot point in a lot of the series is or seasons. Yeah, yeah. Or you know, I watched Doctor Who as well, right? I didn't know you still did. Yeah, I watched all of Doctor Who. Oh, I, I didn't actually that. know that. Well, there you go. Well, what I'm trying to say is I'm a that... comic book nerdy and of course I watch Doctor Who. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is the fact that in Doctor Who it's more of an improvement than this. I mean, depending on who the actor is, depending on who's playing the Doctor at that time, you really feel like he is old, he is tired, he's been alive mm. for thousands and thousands of years. And yeah, he'll do good and bad things. But in this, you kind of like, okay, well... She can't be bothered. She's tired and she's old, which I did like that. Yeah. But I think comparing it to the Doctor, he brings a lot more, he or she, brings a lot more history into that, where this is kind of like, she's tired, she's old, and that's it. Yeah. I felt the comic book, even though it's only five issues long, did a better job of showing how tired she was. Well, it doesn't help that they sanitised her and then they tacked on this whole trite doing good and they don't even know it subplot, yeah. you know, Chiwetel Ejiofor's uh, whiteboard thing with all of the details on. I mean, maybe that's something that comes up later in the comic and it just didn't come up in the first volume, but it felt at odds with the comic book's ethos of immortality is a bit shit and we're just getting by <laughs> and we're a little bit tired of it you know that seems like the comics premise whereas this seemed more like we're put here for a reason and we're trying to help people but we don't even know we're doing hmm. it everyone felt a bit more sanitized considering they're meant to be thousands of years old and have probably had to survive through killing lots of people yeah I think there is a good film in here somewhere, mm. like a really good film, like the flashbacks with Andy and Quinn. It was almost like the first sort of scene, the montage in X-Men Origins with Wolverine and Sabretooth. Yeah. They were fighting through the, the years and everything. I'm not sure that's a ringing endorsement, I'll well, be honest with you. That scene, that's a good scene. <laughs> <laughs> not a good film, but a good scene. But I even said to Kate, like, that history with her and Quinn and fighting through the years and all this sort of stuff, mm. I would want to see that film. Yeah, but then again, that felt like they were setting up for the sequel, especially with the end reveal of her turning up. Yeah. If they had cut all of that, you would have had a tighter one hour, 40 minute film because you would have immediately trimmed about 15, 20 minutes of footage. Yeah. So it sort of swings around about. So they, they would cut that. It's one of the more interesting aspects of the film, but it would make for a tighter film. So... I mean, the one thing that they could do to make the film more interesting in general, and the worst thing for me in this film was the awful use of music. Consistent use of dodgy, forgettable pop songs with really on-the-nose lyrics. It just felt <laughs> lazy, like an episode of Hollyoaks or, or that Ben Affleck Daredevil whenever they cut to Evanescence. <laughs> <laughs> It, it felt oh, like you know what those what those um those rubbish fan edits that teenagers do on the internet you know like what are they called fan cams where they just cut some some action and then put some music over the top of it and it's like some Billie Eilish track or whatever it, it <laughs> felt like that and it just the first time it happened it was jarring hmm. and then each and every time it happened after that it took me out and we and Haley both looked at it and went why are they stop that stop putting this weird <laughs> music over the top there was some weird electro pop music I'm not too sure when it was but it was in the middle of a fight scene or the end of the start of a 
fight scene. I'm like, this music does not suit what you're going for. And they kept doing it. None of the music suited it. There was some sort of moody instrumental and then it would just go into a pop song. And it was like, that doesn't suit, first of all, Immortals, this action scene. You know, there's this one where I think it's Niall is fighting everyone and the lyrics are literally like, I'll kill everyone and stuff like that. And we're just like, oh, that's very on the nose, but okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was the worst part of it. And every time one of them came on, I went, right, well, if I was any way invested in this, I'm now not. I'm completely <laughs> I'm actually quite surprised because you said one thing that you would change is the music. I thought you were going to say the nerdy Silicon Valley bad guy that's a mix <laughs> between, I don't know, Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg. I don't know. Yeah. You know, it's the old blazer hoodie cool guy who's a nerd. and Yeah. Ugh. I've watched a lot of DuckTales lately. It reminded me there's a character called Mark Beeks in that. Uh, so that was, I think I was quite positive on the character after that just because it was reminding me of uh, something I enjoy more. But... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's quite a tired trope now, to be honest. There's a lot of films that use industrialist CEO type character as the villain. And mm. I get it, you know. But then again, this is Netflix putting this film together. So to take the piss out of capitalists is uh, a, a bit rich coming from them. But um, <laughs> I mean... Careful, because, uh, you know, we're not sponsored by them, but we might want to be soon. <laughs> so, yeah, but he was fine. He was old... Um, Dudley from Harry Potter, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, he's fine. He was fine. I didn't mind the villains. I, I mean, I really like Chiwetella Jofor. I, I really like him as an actor. I get a bit tired of him playing subdued villains, is what he seems to get lamped with at a lot of the moment. Yeah. He's, he's an actor with... um. He's got a lot of soul. He's got a lot going on behind the eyes. A lot of internalised acting. You know, it's not quite big, flashy, flamboyant roles. But I always like that about him. So I always feel he should be play more heroes. But... um. Yeah, whatever. He just seems to turn up in very small, villainous roles in a lot of mediocre films. I'm assuming we'll see a, a lot more of him in the sequel because Charlie Theron, if that even how you say her name? <laughs> Probably not. She has said that the script has been written and they'll be shooting next year. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Yeah, so, I mean, apparently there's a sequel coming, but I guess we'll find out and... Yeah. I guess we will. Well, maybe it'll be based on the, the second volume of the comic book, yeah. but... We've obviously not read that, so we'll have to cover that when it comes out. Well, yeah, something that I do appreciate, actually, about the film is that a lot of the dialogue was taken from the comic. Yeah. Probably because the writer, Greg Rucker, yep. was also the screenwriter for the film. Yeah, no, that doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, Greg Rucker is a, a comic book writer that has done a huge amount of work over the years. It's mostly for DC, but he's done for Marvel and independent works as well, stuff like this. Mm -hmm. It turns out I've enjoyed quite a lot of his work. I went back and looked him up, but he's never a writer I've ever really sought out. You know, he's never one I've gone, right, I want to read the latest Greg Rucker work. But <laughs> it did feel, reading the comic to me, it felt like the outline of a film. Reading it was like reading the storyboards for a movie. And I noticed that a lot of Greg Rucker's work, it gets adapted for the screen. So I wouldn't be surprised if the comic was designed to be more of like a proof of concept for a film rather than a comic in its own right. Yeah. He wrote this with a, as an idea for a film treatment and then thought, I'm already in comics, I can get someone to draw this and then I can bring that to studios. Which, considering the only Wikipedia page for The Old Guard is the one for the film, there's not one for the comic book, wouldn't yeah. surprise me. I think that would be the case. You know, I'd never even heard of this before the film came out last year. Mm. But I mean, speaking of the comic book, this seems like a good a time to move on. Any, but I thought it was okay. Pretty good, I guess. Yeah, you know, it's easy. It's a quick read. It was almost like a palette cleanser after spending so much time on Watchmen. Mm. The fact that, that took me days to read, <laughs> this took me an hour. Yeah, which is all the more perplexing why the film took two hours and the comic only takes one. You know, it, it was... It didn't set my world on fire, I'll be honest with you. Yeah. But it maintained my attention while I was reading it for about an hour, yeah. which is better than some comics I've read and certainly more than I can say about the whole film. But yeah, it did take me a couple of issues to get into it. I felt mm. the first two issues, I wasn't particularly invested. And this is what I said about the film. It didn't establish those characters early enough in the comic book. Yeah. It felt like, to me, it didn't really start to pick up until about the third volume by which point you're already halfway through volume one. There's only five issues in total, so you're nearly done. Yeah. The most interesting parts to me in the comic book are kind of like you were saying for the film, are the, the musings on what it is to be immortal, the, the challenges that come with that, not the bits where they're just shooting people. Yeah. So Andy's self-destructive behaviour, the loss of Booker's family when he tells that story, mm -hmm. and you know that intensity of that relationship between Joe and Nikki as two immortals, 
all of that comes around in issues three and four, I think. Yeah. And as I say, the fifth issue is just a pretty generic, boring action assault on a skyscraper where five people who can't die shoot people mm. and just fire endless rounds of ammunition. So there's no jeopardy to that. And so you've basically got issues three and four where you have a bit of character development and then a fifth issue where there's just a big set piece and the first two issues are just build up. And so realistically, only two of those issues to me were good. Yeah. So it made the whole volume in total as a bit average. Perhaps going forward, I, w- I would have more attachment to those characters and I'd enjoy it a bit more. I'd have more attachment to the world, but I can't say I was particularly invested during this volume. What about you? Yeah, what we've said already i guess is the fact that the comic is about andy she's the leader she is the main character Mm. so obviously when they came to adapt it for the film i think they had to flesh out the other characters a lot more and a lot sooner yeah like we said she's a lot hard hitting i guess in the comic she's more interesting absolutely yeah she's rough around the edges in the comic book Mm. certainly she's harder to like in a way but funnily enough that makes me like her more because as she just seems a bit more interesting yeah I actually did it the wrong way around this week is that I watched the film and then read the comic where normally I read the comic first. Okay. Uh, it was just for time purposes and the days that we were both free. Yeah. I think that's how I realised that there are a lot of chunks of the dialogue taken straight out of the book. Mm. And because you've got the creator working so closely on the film, it is a pretty faithful adaptation bar a couple of changes. Yeah. You know, characters change in bits and bobs here. Yeah. And I think they're mostly for the better, the changes. Well, one of the changes is the bad guy. You know, you quite liked him in the film because it made you think about something that you liked. <laughs> I didn't like him in the film because I just thought he was an annoying little twerp. He was much the same character in the comic, though, who's a fairly annoying twerp CEO in the comic, I thought. That was sort of the point of him. Yeah, I think it's the nerdy side of him that I don't like in the film. Right. He's definitely more of like a classic bad guy in the comic. You know, a rich businessman, yeah. arsehole type, which... I buy it that he wants to know the secrets behind these people Mm. being alive forever more in the comic than I do in the film. Mm -hmm. In the film, he's just like, oh, I'm rich. (laughs) Look what I can do. But in the comic, I'm like, well, it would make sense for him to want to find this stuff out because he just seems more human, I guess. Oh, see, I really thought he came off as, well, comic book villain in the comic. I thought he was so two-dimensional. He was so evil for evil's sake. Bleach blonde hair, you know, modern yuppie sort of hipster CEO. (laughs) And, you know, the scene where he's stabbing both Joe and Nikki, Mm. it's so much more intense in the comic book and it's so much more over the top. It's such a I'm the villain moment where he's just doing it over and over again. Whereas in the film, it comes across as a little bit of a spur of the moment thing. Whereas in the comic, it comes across as how do I show this character is textbook evil. And likewise, he seems to relish in the torture of those characters characters for scientific purposes as opposed to the film version who seems quite detached from that he's just like well off you go yeah i thought they were fairly similar characters and different interpretation perhaps i think the core of the story and the essence is the same both comic and film i think you lose a lot more in the film than the comic maybe if we go on to read book two and three and whatever it would get fleshed out a lot more yeah they might have used some stuff in the future in the film i don't know well that's what i'm thinking volume two is apparently a continuation of this story volume three i believe is called through the ages so i think it focuses a lot more on the past which perhaps is yeah. more an interesting aspect certainly the the aspect that i'm more interested in hmm. what did you think about the artwork the art style yeah it's um at times i felt it was a bit jarring i thought some of the character faces were very uh over the top uh, sometimes in an offensive way perhaps but <laughs> just generally people were very ugly and very lumpy but uh yeah no it's fine uh, it's sort of that stylized scrappy one no one really had realistic proportions in their faces they were big noses and big chins and things like that yeah yeah it was okay what about you i think it was definitely a different style to what we've seen before yeah i'd say it's at points quite lazy <laughs> i mean i think it was the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen that you said about the background characters all being individual and all have their own look to it. Yeah. But this one, the background's bland. There is no detail in the background. Mm. Either you get a blurred town or some buildings, or it's just like a solid black or grey or blue or whatever the scene is. It just hears some blue colours in the background and they're sat at a table. Yeah, which would play into that whole idea that this is just a proof of concept for a film as opposed to a comic in its own right, Mm. in that they need to throw something together so they've got a storyboard. Yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to piss all over the artist because, you know, I can't draw. So, (laughs) you know, if I try to do it, 
his work would be an improvement. But yeah, but you can critique something without being able to do it yourself. <laughs> you know, it, it, just because you can't cook doesn't mean you have to eat a turd and say, "Oh, well, that's better than I could do." You know, that's <laughs> it doesn't work like that. So you're allowed to critique stuff like that. And I agree. I think at times it was lazy. I think at times it was a, a little bit messy. But generally, it was fluid. I could follow the action. Mm. The characters were distinct, so I knew who was who. It did the job, but it, I wasn't blown away by it. Much like the comic. Yeah, I don't know really how I feel about the comic. It's okay. It's not offensive. It's not terrible. It's not amazing. It's you know, above average. Yeah. I like the film. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I would put the film below average, but yes. It, it's, <laughs> it's clearly attempting to position itself as something gritty and mature, you know, getting away from the, the sort of comic book style. You know? Yeah. But, for instance, the word fuck and its derivatives are thrown about in pretty much every sentence, every line of dialogue. Mm. And for me rather than that elevating it to a sort of mature status, it actually has the opposite effect. It makes it seem like it's written by a child who's just learnt about naughty swear words. <laughs> it's so juvenile in that approach. What would these thousands of year immortals say? Well, of course they'd swear all the time because that's cool. But yeah, I mean, so I'm glad they, they toned that down for the film. So I guess that's another positive in the film. Yeah, part. well, this comic came out in 2017. So, I mean, what you're saying there about it being childish and swearing and all this sort of stuff and trying to be seedy and dirty and like a, mm. this kind of story. I'd expect that from stuff in like maybe the 90s or the 80s, but it's a fairly new comic. So they're doing tropes that used to be in older comics. Yeah. I know that I can't talk because I've not read a quarter of what <laughs> you've read, probably less, I don't know. But from what we've read over the podcast is that you go back to like Sin City yeah. or uh, Kick-Ass. They were earlier. Well, Kick-Ass was relatively recently as well. That's a fairly new one. But yeah. And actually, I didn't look up the date it was written. I didn't realise it was 2017, mm. which means this probably was written and came out about a year before they started production on the film. And it was much like Kick-Ass. He was probably shopping it around to studios as he was writing it. Yeah, probably. So... It, again plays into that well i've got a comic book i want to adapt but it's not a children's comic it's a mature gritty action-led story they say fuck a lot. yeah look at it look oh well we'll have to tone that down we can't use that many swear words well oh yeah but oh, pretty pretty hardcore right guys aren't i cool <laughs> <laughs> i mean I, I think i'm shitting on it a bit too much because like i say it passed the time i read it it was okay the film i felt was too long yeah i like the ruckus work particularly the ones that have been adapted to the screen they tend to have strong female characters, you know, mm -hmm. to me, Andy in the comics is a lot more interesting than Andy in the film. Yep. I've not seen his other works, but he also wrote Stump Town, which was adapted into a TV show yeah. with uh, Kobe Smulders. And he also wrote Whiteout, which was adapted into a film starring Kate Beckinsale. The follow-up comic to that, right, won an Eisner Award, and I've never even heard of it. Me neither. <laughs> so I added that to our list of upcoming episodes, you'll be pleased to know. So we'll cover that later in the year. <laughs> I quit. No, it's not that bad. Um, yeah, I guess the character that's been replaced in the film is Quinn. So she's not in the comics, or at least the ones that we read. Yeah. There's a character, Noriko, I think it is. Yeah, there was something like that. There's a reference to someone who fell in the water when they were crossing the sea. Hmm. And then there was the whole husband in Australia. That whole plot line was cut. Yeah, it almost feels like that flashback that they did in the comic to her and her husband or whoever was filled with mm. the Iron Maiden thing with Quinn. Which is setting up for a sequel, clearly. Yeah. But yeah, in this, we all know that I do love to talk about things that I've seen as my Easter eggs. Okay, yeah. But yeah, I think if I ramble on any more, you'll go, is this just you setting up for things that you've seen? And uh, yeah, it pretty much is. All right, well, in that case, we wouldn't want you to ramble any more than you already have. So uh, let's get on with it. Ian's, Ian's egg hunt, Ian's, Ian's egg hunt, Ian's, Ian's egg hunt. I'm not yoking you. Well, talking about Quinn then, when the group are having the visions of Niall and she's having visions of them, the last thing that she sees is like a vision of being underwater. It does sort of flash up very, very quickly, mm. but it's showing that she's not only linked with the group, but also linked with Quinn. Yeah. Who, as we've already sort of, said is underwater in that iron maiden type thing yeah, yeah, yeah. so kind of easter draggy kind of foreshadowing thank you completely forgot the word <laughs> you forgot about foreshadowing <laughs> your second favorite thing but yeah it's, there's not many in here to be honest other bits that i've picked up on as well is that in the film i can't remember about the comic but joe is a very good artist is that in the comic 
can't remember. I don't remember it, so I don't even remember it from the film. I'll be um, but yeah, so when they do see the flashes of Niall, oh he yeah, he gets draws out a picture of and, oh, yeah. a bit of pencil and a pen. He gets out a pencil and a bit of paper. He gets out a bit of pencil and starts to draw not only things that he's seen, but what the group has seen as well. Yeah. But something that I did find out is the close up of his hands when he's actually sketching her. It's actually the old guard co-creator and artist, Leandro Fernandez. Oh, all right, okay. So it's actually his hands that are drawing that little sketch. Cool. There you go. And a nice little Easter egg. And I will call that one an Easter egg yeah. that folds together the film and the comic. It does indeed. And you've just spent the last 10 minutes ripping into his art <laughs> as well. So. Well, I hope he doesn't listen to it. It's a good job we didn't have to draw any backgrounds in that one. <laughs> <laughs> but then also in the film towards the end, the pub that was used is called the Prospect of Whitby, right. which is said to be London's oldest shoreside pub or riverside pub. Mm -hmm. There was a sign on the wall that it flashes up quite quickly again about it, it having 500-year-old floorboards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I just think it's quite nice to bring that in. It fits well with the whole story of the characters, really, and the history of how old things are. Yeah. And then we briefly spoke about it earlier on, but the last kind of scene, you know, the pre-credits, sort of like, oh, Quinn's back. Yeah. I don't know if this was put in on purpose or not, <laughs> but I do like that she was drinking a glass of water. So like a little nod to the fact that she's now not afraid of swallowing water. She's <laughs> her fear of drowning and dying over and over again. Did she have a fear of drowning? Well, she, she, she was under the... She did drown over and over yeah. again. I don't know if she had a fear of doing that. Well, I, she... I, I assume that if you spent 500 years underwater drowning, that you would hate the feeling of... You would not want to drink water anymore. Wow, well, yeah. She just, she prefers to slowly... Slowly dehydrate to death <laughs> and then reheal from that is preferable to drinking some water. Well, you know, it's probably something that, that they put in just to go, or show that she's over it and I don't know. <laughs> good for her. Accomplished her fears of glasses of water. <laughs> no, good stuff. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, shall we uh, wrap up things on the old guard before we go on to uh, any other business, whatever you've got for us this week? Yeah, all right. So overall... Both me and Haley actually came to the same conclusion on the film, which was that it is far too boring for such an interesting premise. Mm. By shying away from the, the less wholesome aspects of the characters in the comic book, I feel that it created a much more sanitised take on immortality, which it just wasn't as interesting. It wasn't interesting enough to support a rather thin plot that it had from the comic books. So overall, for me, the script wasn't cerebral enough to make it a clever action film and it wasn't executed well enough to be a fun exciting action film <laughs> what about you yeah i mean above average entertaining film hmm. i wouldn't say boring you know i've seen a lot worse films than this and that's coming from me oh believe me i've seen worse but this weekend <laughs> as, a, as an example i've watched jungle cruise and space jam 2 and I would say this is the worst film I've watched this weekend. Wow. Yeah. I had such high hopes for Space Jam 2. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> I'm not sure if my sarcasm's coming across the mic there. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> and uh, the comic book? Yeah, uh, you know, easy to read, passes time. I would say if you've watched the film, I would say read the comic. Okay. But I probably wouldn't recommend either. But if someone had said to me, oh, I watched The Old Guard the other day, it was all right, wasn't it? I'd go, yeah, well, now read the comic. Yeah, I mean, I think if someone enjoyed it, perhaps. I mean, you mentioned Watchmen earlier, actually, and, mm. and I think we talked last episode about Watchmen and how it uses every tool in its arsenal, comic book storytelling methods, to create a rich, dense world. And that ultimately meant that it was quite difficult to adapt for film yeah this feels like the complete opposite to me oh yeah this feels like rucker had an idea for a film but decided to make a comic book first so he could sell it to studios it's okay in a sort of fluffy action heavy kind of way but the end result ends up being a bit throwaway and forgettable much like the film but yeah yeah it passes time if you've got let's say three hours to kill <laughs> and you want to watch the film and then read the comic by all means. yeah i mean i don't think i'd recommend either I probably wouldn't recommend the film, <laughs> but if someone had watched it, I'd then go right now, go read the comic. Yeah, I think if someone enjoyed it, not necessarily if someone, wa if someone watched it and absolutely hated the film, I wouldn't recommend they go and read the comic. I don't think that's going to change their opinion on things. I would make them. <laughs> I would make them read the comic. <laughs> I would make them pay for the comic first, single issue by single issue, and force them to yeah. read it. But I think if someone enjoyed the film, <laughs> which I 
you know, I'm sure there must be people out there who did. I don't think it's offensive enough to have no fans at all. So, you know, I think if someone enjoyed <laughs> the film, they, they should probably go out and read the comic book. It was all right. I am tempted myself to read volume two and just see how it goes. So that's something. It's not a complete write-off. Yeah, I think for completionist sake, Yeah, I kind of want to see where it goes, but... I'm not in any rush. I won't run out of the shop now and buy it and pick it up. If no. I come across it at some point, then if I've got time to kill, I might read it. Exactly. I was getting interested in these characters enough by the end of the comic book to want to see where they went. But like you say, not enough to go out and buy the comic book straight away. Mm. And maybe if that had come earlier, I would have been more invested. But hey. But obviously there's one more opinion to get. So what is Kate's opinion of the film this week? Well, her little quick opinion is the complete opposite of what we've sort of said. <laughs> oh, okay, right. She said, good concept. Fair enough, we've already said that. Yeah, that's Great right. fight scenes. We touched on that. I wouldn't necessarily agree, but yeah. <laughs> and then she said, I didn't get bored. I definitely would disagree. Okay, <laughs> right, well, fair enough. Well, that's it for the old guard. So, any other business? One question that I want to ask you today. Okay, and what, what is that question, Ian? Hey, Ian. What have you been up to lately? Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> is that, that, that's the new theme tune, is it? I, I don't know. I just wanted to film. I bet your mic spiked crazily like that. <laughs> I wanted to uh, <laughs> just fill in the time. Great. Okay. What have I been up to lately? I have been reading comic books as per usual. I have been on uh, Marvel Unlimited, as always. I've read a lot of my usual stuff, X-Men pretty much everything, Spider-Man, uh, Avengers, all of that. Mm -hmm. The best comic book I've read on Marvel Unlimited this week is Way of X by Cy Spurrier. Really, really good tie into the X titles, the big X universe crossover things mm -hmm. we've got at the moment. And it is about Nightcrawler, is the main character, struggling with his mm. faith in a post-resurrection world. So obviously the X-Men have defeated death. They have a way of resurrecting anyone who dies is the current plot line. Mm -hmm. And it is Nightcrawler sort of coming to terms with that as a concept and how it ties into his Christianity, his faith and his beliefs. And also trying to create a new way, a way of X for this new society. So yeah, really, really good. Some high concept stuff, but also just really good fun action and very well-defined characters. It's written by the same guy, Cy Spurrier, who did X-Men Legacy, which focused on David Haller, uh, Legion, mm -hmm. which was an inspiration for the Legion TV show, which was really good. That was a really good run in the comics as well. So that's the best thing I've read on Marvel Unlimited this week. Other comics I've read, Through the Woods by Emily Carroll, which is a, a sort of beautifully presented, atmospheric collection of gothic horror fairy tales really well told i mean you can whiz through that quite quickly but quite nice to turn the lights off and read that it's uh, a nice well not turn the lights off because you won't be able to see the pages but <laughs> i'm just gonna say you, you, you can't do pictures <laughs> isn't it? um but no really lovely little fairy tales uh but all with a, a horror tinge very much horror inflected like classic horror tales grimm's fairy tales things like that i also read uh, home time by campbell white which is a bit like over the garden wall in that it's uh all ages is production but it's got a very uh, sinister undertone it's about a group of kids who fall in a river and wake up in this sort of fantasy world i read the first volume of that it's quite called cool. the art changes chapter by chapter depending on which character it's following so you've got one who's very bright and colorful and one that's all 8-bit uh, and sort of looks like a, a video game so hmm. yeah no really cool stuff like that cool. so that's the comic books i've been reading and i have been to the cinema three times since we last recorded so good for me doing my best to keep them afloat i watched the sparks brothers the edgar wright documentary about sparks the band mm -hmm. excellent excellent documentary i would highly recommend that if you are a fan of documentaries if you're a fan of music if you're a fan of the whole idea about it is um this band have been going for years and years and years and they keep shifting and they never really do what people expect them to do and they always seem quite ahead of the curve in terms of musical outlay and you know a lot of stuff they produce becomes quite popular shortly after they've done it but they never really got the acclaim for that sort of thing you know it's sort of a, a celebration of creativity against commercialism but uh yeah no really good documentary even if you know nothing about the band it's worth seeing so is the band a real band it's not like it's a real um, yeah, yeah. spinal tap no it's not a comedy it, it's a real band sparks they've existed for years uh in fact Kickass, the episode, one of their songs appears in that. Uh, this town ain't big enough for the both of us. Oh. When he's trying on the cape and <laughs> kicking in the mirror. And kicking ass. And kicking ass. 
I also went to see Battle Royale. It's the 20th anniversary of that. And I don't really need to say much about that. It's been out for 20 years. If you haven't seen Battle Royale already, go and see it. It's really good. It's uh, <laughs> one of my favourite films. So I went to see it in the cinema because it was out there again. And I have never seen it on the big screen. And it is just brilliant, madcap, melodrama, action satire just great stuff and lastly a big one that we probably should talk about once you've seen it is the suicide squad mm. or the suicide squad as you would call it suicide squad no 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 not to be confused with suicide squad which was the first one this is the suicide squad oh sorry right yeah so yeah. there was suicide squad then there was the suicide squad yep squad i don't even say it <laughs> i don't even know what i said <laughs> yeah i need to find time to go and see it yeah it's on my list of stuff to go and, you know, and it's something that I want to go see on the big screen. I think you'll really like it. I liked it. I enjoyed it a lot. I'm liking being back at the cinema, so I think that helped. I think it's right up your alley in terms of that sort of irreverence that it has to it. I think you would like that a lot. But as I say, we'll talk about that more once you've seen it. But yeah, that's what I've been up to lately. But Ian. Yeah. Um, I don't, what, what, what have you been up to lately? Oh, thanks for asking. I've actually not been reading any other comics apart from this one. Oh, okay. Because I've been lazy, you but have I been have lazy. been catching up. <laughs> I've been catching up with me uh, CW shows. Right. So I watched all of Flash season seven, mm-hmm. and I'd say the first half, maybe a little bit more of Legends of Tomorrow season six. Right. Mm-hmm. I would say they've both dipped in quality <laughs> since they first came out. You surprise me. Jesus, can they dip in quality any <laughs> further? I've not seen them. I can't. That's unfair. Well, in my opinion, Flash has always been quite fun. You know, not as dark as Arrow. It's always been fun. Yeah. But then the last couple of seasons have just been a little bit too much and too daft. And Well, season seven, they introduce Bart okay. as Impulse. Yeah. And they bring back Nora as excess right which is quite nice just to see her again because i quite like that character which was in season six i want to say or five i can't not a clue don't don't know but then with legends of tomorrow it's always been quite campy and quite fun to watch and it's a time traveling show so it's like you know let's go to france in the 1800s let's go to space let's go to here you know it's campier version of like doctor who kind of thing campier version of doctor (laughs) yeah wow season six is all about clones and aliens and those sort of things Hmm. and it does have matt ryan playing Constantine. Oh yeah, cool. Which, which is always a plus. Him as that character doesn't get enough praise in my book. If you've only seen the Constantine film and that's your only view of Constantine, like mine was before he came into this show or before I watched his own show, even though that wasn't great, his portrayal of that character to me is actually really good. Oh good. It's the classic blonde hair, long coat, the red tie kind of thing. So he does look comic accurate. Is he Liverpudlian? He is. Well, he's definitely English. He's pretty sure he is. Cool. That's good. What else have you been up to? Me and Kate have been watching a few films lately. We try and get in a good film a week. Mm -hmm. We watched The Lego Movie 2. (laughs) Okay. It's all right. Not as good as The Lego Movie 1. No. (laughs) It's all right. It's fun to watch. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say on that. (laughs) I also introduced her to one of your favourite films, Dread. Oh, yeah. We talked about that on our WandaVision episode. We did, yeah. So we finally got around to watching it <laughs> after <laughs> bloody four months or something stupid. Six months. <laughs> and what did she think? Oh, she thought it was great. Oh, good. Yeah, because she does get bored very quickly with action scenes. And if it's just punch, block, punch, block, down, up, like a stupid old game, really. Yeah. Throw a toilet at someone, throw a sink at someone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But she said that each of the fights were different. It was nice that as he was going up the block, yep. you have to adapt or run out of bullets or bombs or whatever, this and that. So she actually had a really good time with it, which I was a tad sceptical that she wouldn't enjoy it as much as I thought that she did. Mm. But no, yeah, it was something that she was like, yeah, that was that was fun. It was different. It was unusual. Good. Yeah. Let's try her on the rage next. I don't think I've seen that. That's a similar premise. Yeah. SWAT team goes into a block of flats, has to fight their way to the top floor, but with more martial arts. Yeah, we definitely spoke about it the odd week back when we were out and about. I think I spoke about it earlier in this episode. (laughs) Yeah, I I mentioned that any chance I can, I'll be honest. (laughs) Hello and welcome to our new episode, Watch the Raid. Not in the intro, stop it. (laughs) (laughs) And is that all? Well, I've got one more question for you. And that question is, what if? What if what? What if? What if? What if what? Exactly, yeah, what if what? It's our new segment. (laughs) 
No, the new What If show. Yeah. Obviously, when this does go out, there'll be three episodes up. Yep. They've only just released the first one. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you've watched it. If not, this part of the show's absolutely crap. It's going to be one-sided. Uh, no, I have watched it. I have watched <laughs> it. I, uh, I watched it when it came out. What did you think of it? I really enjoyed it. It's definitely intriguing. I like that it came after Loki because it's now opened up a whole new sort of playground of various timelines and I'm going to enjoy it a lot more now that I've seen Loki. Okay, okay. It came out the other way around. I don't think my interest would be there. Yeah, but I know what you mean. like I said, back in our New Year's episode, it's one of the ones out of what's been announced that I was most excited to see. Hmm. I think the first episode wasn't great. It's got its flaws, hmm. but I like the premise and I think other characters that I'm more involved with or I'd rather see T'Challa as Star-Lord than I would rather see Peggy as Cap. That's fair. In my opinion. So I really enjoyed it. I really liked seeing Peggy as Cap. I like those what-if stories in the comic books. Some people have criticised the running time. They, it's less than 30 minutes long, but... That works. I think that's perfect. I don't need to see a whole rehash of Captain America the First Avenger, mm. but with Captain Carter instead. I think it gets all the action beats you need in. It shows where the story divulges. I, no, I think it did a really good job. I thought it was real fun. I'm interested to see if there is an overarching narrative. Yeah. As we discovered with our Fantastic Four episode, you are to the Watcher is incapable of staying out of things. <laughs> it is his one defining character trait is that he is a Watcher who is not allowed to interfere, but always does. <laughs> so it will be interesting to see if by the end of the series he has interfered with at least one thing, because I'm almost certain he will. I don't think we can call him... The Watcher. I think we should call him like the Interferer or something stupid because he always interferes. Perhaps. But yeah, can we just comment on the casting of the Watcher? Oh yeah. Jeffrey Wright, right. I want to mm -hmm. say. Yep. As the Watcher, that voice is just spot on. Well, he's done. got a good voice, isn't he? And it is. There's a lot of intelligence and wisdom behind that voice mm. that he's doing. And yeah, it's perfect for that character. Love well, it. You were talking about the sort of intertwining, overarching storyline. I believe, I don't know if this is fact or not, but I believe that they've already renewed it for a season two. They have. And I think Captain Carter's in that. Oh, uh, okay. Or maybe later on in season one. So I don't know if they are trying to build up with something. Or potentially, they'll do one a week of here's a possible storyline mm. and then depending on the fans reactions go well actually that episode back in the pilot with captain carter that was like the best episode we've done so therefore let's make a film out of it it's possible so they could be sort of what's the sort of term not treading water um there's a water something there um <laughs> Testing the water? Testing the water, thank you. Not treading there the water. There we go. Testing the water. Yeah, no, yeah. maybe. I mean, with the comics, the what if comic books, they would revisit the same events, but from different angles. So yeah. the more popular events would get different. Well, what if this happened and what if this happened? So yeah, potentially you could revisit those things. I could see the same voice actors coming up. It might not even be Captain Carter. It might be Peggy Carter. So hmm. who knows? But yeah, I actually quite like having something that is relatively standalone as opposed to tied into a bigger universe for once. So yeah. even if it's something we're familiar with. But yeah, is that all for today? I believe so. Okay, then. Well, that's all from us. Thank you very much for listening. If you enjoyed The Old Guard by Greg Rucker, then I can heartily recommend his collaboration with Ed Brubaker on Gotham Central. Also, why not check out the Eisner Award winning Queen and Country or Whiteout ahead of our episode on that film later this year. For that episode and more, make sure you subscribe to Become the Teapot on your preferred podcasting platform. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at becometheteapot at hotmail.com or tweet us at becometheteapod. We are also available on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. Join us next time as we go from guards to guardians. And yes, these segues are becoming increasingly tenuous. We're going to be watching Guardians of the Galaxy and seeing where the team kind of began in the comic books as we dip our toes into the periphery of one of the better Marvel events with Annihilation Conquest, Star-Lord. Let's find let's out. Let's find out. <laughs> oh, no, I'll just count down for that. Three, two, one. Let's, let's find, find out. out. Let's just both say it individually and I'll, I'll lap them over each other. Okay. Let's find let's out. Let's find out. <laughs> Hit stop. Right, we'll stop it there.